and I'll be the facilitator for today's webinar. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm joining you today. And I also extend that to the traditional custodians you are all representing today, as well as elders past, present and emerging. Might just start off with just a few housekeeping matters. Firstly, um, just a reminder that this event will be recorded. If you could, um, please keep yourself on mute during the presentations. And uh, finally, please put questions that you have in the chat and we will get to them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And if we have time, we will um, get you to come off mute and ask those questions. The purpose of today's webinar is to get uh, a better understanding of the financial side of implementing a carbon project. So I'd like to welcome our guest speaker for today, Raphael Wood. Raphael is the Principal for Sustainability and Climate Change with Oricon. He's also the Director of the Carbon Market Institute, Managing Director of the Market Advisory Group, and Co-Managing Director of Silver Capital. He has over 25 years experience across environmental, financial and e economic roles in both the the public and the private sectors, and provides advice to carbon market participants across government, liable entities and project developers. RAF was instrumental in designing Australia's carbon markets and is sought after for his independent carbon market advice. I'm now going to hand over to Raphael, who will provide an overview of carbon finance and market trends. Thanks, Raf. Sherry, um, uh, thanks for having me today. Apologies, I have a slight cold, so if I have to cough, uh, I'll, I'll try to pause the screen and do that. Um, it's great to be here and be able to talk to you about uh, so this emerging opportunity uh, for carbon projects in, um, in particularly in the Riverina. Um, I, as, as um, um, my introduction said I've been in this industry for a long time and, and I've seen it um, grow from a, an idea in, in, in a politician's mind through to um, investment by uh, superannuation funds and pension funds. So it's, it's matured from, from very, very much nothing to a point where um, it's now considered a, an investment grade uh, understood, where the risks are understood uh, and the opportunities and, and returns are, are fairly well um, uh, fairly well known. So. And my, my plan today is to answer questions mostly. I'm going to try not to just talk. Um, it's uh, the specific questions that uh, you're, you'll be interested in asking. I'm happy to answer those. I've answered sort of most questions that the, the, uh, the, the, the world can throw. So please feel free to. There, there aren't any silly ones. If I, haven't, if I don't cover off something in, in, in simple detail, please um, let me know. And if you want more detail, um, also just let me know. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and we'll uh, try to get that into reading mode. Um, I should start with a uh, disclaimer. Um, for the car Australian Carbon Credit Unit is the carbon credit that you will produce if you undertake a carbon project. Uh, that, car that ACCU, as I'll refer to it from this point on, Australian Carbon Credit Unit, is a financial product under the Corporations Act and therefore is administered and overseen by Australian Securities Investment Commission. Therefore, anyone who's talking to you about carbon projects, particularly carbon pricing and carbon supply or ACU supply, uh, needs to have an AFSL. Uh, and we have an AFSL, uh, and uh, to, you need to see that disclaimer. Everything I say today is just general advice. Don't please don't walk away from any, any with anything in your mind. I'm going to show you some pictures, some graphs of future price forecast, etc. They're out of date so that I can show them to you. Please don't rely on them. Uh, they're just there for uh, discussion. Um, and please don't screenshot and share this um, presentation around that is copyrighted. Um, the talk outline today is going to just going to go through uh, how landholder will generate carbon credits and what your options are. And I'll talk to that pretty much straight away. Um, are there predictions or trends in the carbon market in Australia? Absolutely. Um, and I'll talk about the different prices between methodologies. 
and how you can achieve a premium price because I'll, I'll, I'll sort of show you how the market has started to separate um, from a simple base carbon credit to a high premium value carbon credit. We'll talk about what those values are and how, how you can uh, get involved in those higher prices. Who's buying them? Why are they buying them? Um, what are the greatest financial risks to consider? Um, and that it's a long relationship um, and you know, who, who, you can, who you can partner with and, and the things you need to consider. So I think yeah, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a sec so I can see you all. Um, right, back to, back to the screen. Um, the, car, the carbon market has evolved a lot, as I said. We're now at a point where some of the lower cost methodologies um, have been implemented and have been saturated. There's not a lot of opportunity left in that space. You might have heard if you're, if you're um, following carbon markets, thing, uh, methods like human-induced regeneration, uh, which have uh, been the mainstay of the carbon industry for the last decade. They're the main, they're the main uh, supplier of carbon credits. But you've also may have, uh, and, and you obviously here, you know of environmental plantings, planting mixed species um, plantings to to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere into the trees. Um, environmental plantings is what I'll refer to that method as. It's got a longer name and it may change its name in the future. But environmental plantings, as, as you would um, look to do, uh, here uh, is is a method that's the next large method, a large scale method um, for supplying accus into the market. Uh, the market's quite mature. The, the mar there are trades in the carbon market every day. Uh, brokers uh, in the market, commodities brokers, trade carbon, and and uh, you can access their platforms and and get advice from them about carbon uh, carbon pricing and and selling carbon credits. Uh, they generally trade in larger volumes around 5,000 at a time, which makes it difficult for small scale um, sellers to get involved. But if you have a relationship with some with a with a buyer who likes your project and has done due diligence on your project, you may be able to find you have a buyer for those um, for those uh, accus. Uh, a good a good I will go back to the screen uh, and just uh, just now before I do, there are other methodologies that you've probably heard about um, and you might be looking at, and they're called similarly. The uh, most common one would be soil carbon. There's a lot of talk about soil carbon, particularly down in your area. Soil carbon is where you change your management practices. You take a baseline of the carbon in your soil uh, at the start of the project, and as you do activities and management changes to the to the landscape or to your agricultural um, activities, you will sequester carbon into the soil, increase the but the the, um, the the carbon in the soil, uh, better soils equal higher carbon. It's a, it's a generally correlated. So there's that that's out there. But that's that's got its own nuances around risk and and the understanding of how much carbon can you actually sequester in any hectare at any point in time into the future. How many how much is going to be sequestered over a seven year period or in year ten or year fifteen? Um, so those kind of questions make soil carbon um, somewhat more difficult to finance and to um, to get some some sort of real return estimates on um, the other one, uh, there's this plantation forestry. So you may have had people approach you for or heard of people in the area looking at doing timber plantations for production of timber, but also to sequester carbon. Um, that's also an option uh, to consider, and it, it's that's one where you you probably def, you almost definitely need to have the support of a of an expert in uh, timber forestry. Um, the other main three that you're going to come across uh, that you can do on your properties and how they integrate and mix is, a, is another thing you need to consider. Um, so I think the best thing to do is look at the carbon market itself, uh, just, to, just to start a conversation about um, what carbon price is, how real is it, um, and what are the trends in it. It's, it's always an interesting slide. So I'm sharing a slide of the historical prices for carbon uh, over the last five years. And you can see the volatility or the spikes show increased trade in and increased activity. And at the very start, it was very small um, volumes traded in the market. And I'm think I'm, I'm I'm talking about five thousand a week, five thousand carbon credits. We now see about two million to three million carbon credits traded per month. Um, most of the buyers of carbon credits are your uh, the, the, those you would consider emitters, the, 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 the carbon polluters, if you want to use those words, but they're referred to as liable entities. They're liable under the scheme. Uh, and they include Shell, BP, Woodside, uh, BHP, Rio Tinto, Qantas, all of those, um, those industries 
that uh, just through the nature of their industry um, produce carbon dioxide or methane. Um, the 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 there interestingly from about middle of 2022 we started to see that line change from a single price a single blue line to a disseminated do, uh, number of trades and i hope you can see on your screen there are yellow dots uh, scattered throughout this area and red and red dots up the top there and also this green line started to emerge different buyers will pay a premium for different kinds of accus the base the blue line is a is generic price. It's the price for a carbon credit that has no intrinsic value other than its ton of CO2. And they are from um, from projects like waste management. Uh, you, you might your local your local tip might be capturing methane and flaring that, um, and so they'll get carbon credits for doing that. Um, that that that's probably the main one. Um, waste management uh, is is an energy efficiency landfill gas uh, and alternative waste treatment. They they's what form that blue line. Those that have potentially a biodiversity and conservation outcome trade at a slightly higher premium. So human-induced regeneration is the green line that, that, that started to separate and had a premium above the, the generic unit. That premium has largely disappeared in recent times because of the integrity of that method and the um, constant attacks that that method has in the media. So the perceived benefit of that is outweighed by the perceived integrity question was the was the forest going to grow anyway? Is there really a um, is there really carbon being sequestered that that wouldn't have happened that would have happened anyway? Um, so should you be paid for it? Now the answer to that is absolutely you should, and that it's a quite a valid methodology. And if you're in, get involved in it, it's it's a good project, and it does generate real carbon sequestration. But the market gets a bit uh, getting gets a bit sensitive in paying a premium for that when it comes under integrity questions. The other two dots, the other two colours there are environmental plantings and savannah burning. I'll, I'll focus on savannah burning first. That's the yellow, um, the yellow dots. You you really probably can't participate in that very much. It's a, it's it's a, at all. It's very much a northern Australia uh, open savannah uh, methodology where you burn uh, cold fires instead of letting the wildfires rip through every summer um, and change the emissions and the you know, and the and the burning of the habitat um, and the and the forests. By doing so, and you, you reduce that, you produce less emissions. They trade at a higher premium, almost entirely because they they have quite an engagement with the indigenous communities, and so there's what's called an indigenous co-benefit. So the benefit of that project, money flows through to um, the local indigenous communities, and workers on that uh, on those projects are often from the indigenous community. So the market will pay a premium. But what you can see there is it's scattered. Um, for example, that premium that they're paying. Sometimes it's it's a few dollars, and other times it's a hundred percent increase, and that is valued. People pay those different prices because of the, the the absolute value that flows through to the community. So the higher the price you get, um, sorry, the more uh, engagement with the indigenous communities and and workers and indigenous um, businesses, the higher the premium you'll receive because of that 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 measured or perceived uh, greater impact on indigenous communities. That's largely paused in the spot market. I'm actually showing you um, spot market. I'll come back to that, and if I forget, um, please remind me to to just talk about the differences. But I will I will go back to it. Um, most of those, because we're trying to value something that is needs to be measured and needs time to feed, to understand how much value is actually flowing to through to indigenous communities. Most of those trades occur in a bilateral way between a buyer and seller, they're given time to do due diligence and actually look through to uh, the project itself. Um, that would be a bit like um, organic, potentially selling some kind of organic um, commodity off your property. If you if you just grew wheat, then you could sell wheat on the spot market through a commodities broker. Uh, and that would be, you know, you'd see the prices every day as you work, as you do with most of your commodities, and you'd sell into that market on a day day by day basis. That's the spot market or on the spot transactions. For those looking to um, maybe do some kind of a premium product like uh, organic wheat, the buyer probably sets up a bilateral contract with you. So you might have um, a, a, a flour mill or somebody wanting to secure and be sure that the, the wheat you're producing is uh, organic and ticks those boxes. So you'd set up a, a contract. With, with that with that buyer that is very much between the two of you 
they don't occur there if they don't show therefore on the spot markets you don't see them trade and there was a question around integrity of um the commodity oh, sorry the code benefit here came in about middle of um 2023 that meant most of those transactions for the indigenous savannah burning went off market and over the counter bilateral between two buyers and sellers environmental plantings is the final one that's the red one and that's something that you you'll obviously almost certainly have been a bit surprised at straight away immediately looking at it it's a material premium um, that can be paid for environmental plantings in the early days early days of environmental planting supply which is only in the last year or two these projects have come online we saw some large premium sixty dollars traded on a day that the underlying uh, the underlying um, carbon price for generics was about 30 so that's a hundred percent premium now don't think don't lock that in as an anchor in your thinking that was a one-off uh, one or two trades only one or two trades occurred there and they were because there was very little supply of environmental plantings credits at that time these ones were um, so much sought after by the buyer who wanted a good story about uh, the, the plantings project that had uh, integrated agriculture um, and uh, some indigenous engagement and uh, and also the biodiversity and conservation value of of, of connecting um, biodiverse landscapes so that had some premium but most of it was scarcity there just wasn't a lot around and you know if you're holding on to a commodity that no one else has you can demand a higher price you can see that that scarcity is starting to come off and we're starting to see that gap thin narrow uh, to represent really the biodiversity and conservation slash agricultural productivity and integration community outcomes those kind of co-benefits that's what that's what we're seeing now and there's still a premium there uh, and on this screen if you can't see it we're talking about trades around $35 in the spot market at a time when you can get it the EP traded at about 48 so about a $10 a $10 premium on $38 base price um, this graph I could talk to for a long period of time good things to digress on here I, I'm at first I'll go back to the difference a different way options and I'll again change my screen because you've all seen that um, I'll look at you now uh, the different options for selling your units you can use a broker uh, and you can and you can call them up and say I've got a few thousand to sell a number that you have to sell they've been issued to you by the clean energy regulator and uh, and they'll find a buyer for you and, and charge you a, a brokerage fee for that sale and, and that's it's done it goes from your um, your registry account, your account with the government where the where your carbon credits are held, and it transfers over to the um, to the broker, and they transfer after they pay you. They pay you first, and then you transfer the carbon credits. Um, as I said, the the main one for environmental plantings or any project with a premium is to set up a bilateral um, this, uh, contract with with a counterparty. So that that's an option. The other one is forward contracts. Um, just like any commodity, you can trade forwards and futures is probably the word you'd use more in the in the agricultural commodity market. But they're a similar thing, trading for a supply to deliver into the future. And you don't have to have the carbon credits in the same way. You don't have to have the, the wheat in a silo. You, you're going to plant it and you can lock in a price for that for that product a year out. Uh, but in carbon markets, you, can, you lock that in for 10 years, um, which... I'll come back to actually the cost and why you would do that and lock in uncertainty. Um, uh, so they're the main ways. There are uh, there's, the government is setting up an, an ASX, Australian Stock Exchange, contract where you can trade carbon credits on the ASX. Now, they're very likely to be that base unit. So you're not going to see, you're not really going to want to sell there because it's going to be the lowest price and you're not going to get a premium for it. Um, and there is a futures contract uh, with the ASX futures market. Uh, again, it'll be for the base unit, so you probably wouldn't use that. The best way for you to sell your carbon credits is to form a relationship with a broker or a buyer or have an aggregator or an intermediary sell them for you, and that might be um, uh, the LLS or, or some uh, some structure that, that put, brings together a bunch of sellers or a bunch of projects and looks to enter into contracts um, for you uh, with the seller to keep make it easier for you. And they'll be very they need to be very transparent about the, the cost the price they're selling them for and you need to agree to that uh, that's that you have to evolve how that would work but that's one of the ways that it's done is through what's called an intermediary uh, who acts between the buyer and the seller carbon projects run through um, a framework such as such as this 
uh, with the group of you, um, with groups doing it uh, through a government grant, would probably come with a premium because it's government backed and government supported and managed well. So there's a there's a lot less risk to the buyer that something's not quite right or the, the, the landowner is doing something that they can't see. Um, if it's managed well and, the, and there's an intermediary in place, that's, what, that's a great way to do it. Um, they're the main ways of selling. Uh, I'll st that's enough for that. I'll maybe come back to please send some questions through um, if you've got any, and I'll follow up on on that. Um, going back to the presentation, um, the other thing to consider is when you're doing your project, um, how much? What does it cost, and what are the returns? Yeah, the, the, the two key, the two key questions, of course, you have in the finance financing a project um, consideration. Uh, you have to spend money. Um, it's, it's it's like a commodity. It's like a crop. You've got to spend money to to plant the crop. In this case, you're um, you're getting seedlings planted in your paddocks. Uh, you're going to need to have um, fencing up to spec uh, up to spec so you can keep stock and cattle out or cattle sheep um, etc. out of your of your paddock while you're planting it. Um, and uh, a bunch of things I'll come back to. The, I've got this picture on screen. I should explain this picture. The main consideration is how many carbon credits per hectare can you actually achieve on your on your on your property? And this map is a map that's from the CSIRO. It's a uh, maximum biomass. That, so that's the maximum biomass that can be sequestered on at a, at a particular point. This actually goes down to the 0.2 of a hectare. A pixel on this picture is 0.2 of a hectare. Um, I think that's about 50 by 50 meters. It's quite small, um, and that would be right. Maybe less, maybe very small than that. Um, and you can see that there are some areas um, where there the blue uh, are very high carbon yields. They would be those dark blue would 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 yield around 800 carbon credits per hectare over the life of the project. Uh, that brings me back to scale. So please remind me if I forget to talk about scale. But if 800, if you can get 800 uh, per hectare and you can do 100 hectares. Um, then you're, you know, you're you're up and running in terms of the number of the, the volume you can get over 25 years, and you can get a carbon price that's got a premium. You can do the math on the the potential, um, the potential revenue. The cost is is pretty well understood. Uh, there are there are probably half a dozen uh, project service providers. Green Green in Australia is one. Um, Covalent Land is a company that I'm part of that does this. Um, CO2 Australia, there are a bunch out there and, and, and I, I wouldn't preference any. Um, you need to form a relationship with those with those providers who can come in, they'll gather the seed, they'll send it off to the nursery, the nursery will grow the seedlings, they'll come and do the seeding. They've got, you've got costs like ripping, as I said, fencing before, you've got to rip the soil, so you've got to put a, a big ripper um, in the where you're planting the trees, you've got to manage weeds uh, pre-planting uh, pre but also post-planting. You've got an opportunity to have your paddock fallow. When you, in fact, you have to have it fallow. So you wouldn't want to put stock into a paddock that has a one-foot seedling um, trying to trying to emerge. Um, so you'll need to you'll need to consider having stock off your property for several for several years. I'm going to flip this um, map off, but as like as you can see, there's quite a variation. The red out in the left there is about 100 uh, accus per. A hectare over the life of the project versus, as I said, 600 upwards up to 1,200 um, accus over the life of the project. So I'll come back to looking at you. So um, we will. It's in terms of um, getting an understanding of that full cam model that I just showed you. Uh, the the the, the accus that you can get. There are plenty of sites um, that you can. Um, that you can go to, uh, that you can measure, you can estimate, you put in your, your um, property boundary uh, and receive a, a, a data drop of the number of carbon credits you could sequester on that property. Um, uh, and I think I'd, I'd reach out to the team here uh, for those links um, at, uh, after the presentation if you're interested. Um, I think Look C is one that I've used before. It's a government It's a government site, L-O-O-C. Um, You'll have to Google it because I've forgotten the actual address. Um, but it's a uh, but but Kate is probably going to be able to, to to send that through, uh, and you can get an estimate of the number of accus. You then need to get someone to help you to plant them. Um, that is a key. You've got to form a relationship with someone who can who can plant them. Now you could, by rights, do it yourself. Um, I would suggest that there's a fair bit of 
governance and administration required in working with the regulator that I mean you have to get right so um you know make sure you're doing it right because, and, and, but if you do it through this scheme then someone should help you to do that and get that right um so take that risk off and then sourcing the right plant the right trees for the right spot on your property and planting it at the right time is super critical if you get those wrong they just don't grow or they die you have to go and plant again you get no carbon credits for a failed crop in the same way you get no commodity price for a failed crop difficult to insure as well so there is there's very little insurance around the crop um of, of, the, of trees but it, i'm using the word crop interchangeably here but it's not a crop that you can harvest you uh you're just sequestering the carbon that's your commodity um the lots of questions there that I, i'm trying to cover off for you all but um the in terms of attracting a premium price you need to actually also plan how you're going to design your project so you really do want someone to come and help you design your project um where on your property could you look at um, planting trees in a way that integrates with your agriculture so can you plant a certain tree species at a wider spacing say eight meter spacing that you can still run machinery through still manage um still manage hay hay bales hay baling or uh, weed spraying uh, in into row between the rows of trees can you still then manage uh, have agricultural activities and, and graze under those trees certainly um if you're here looking at this you've probably come across silver pasture as a as a concept silver pasture in the in the uh, true sense is, is plantation forestry and growing uh, and, and running cattle and stock uh, under timber forest but it absolutely applies to the carbon forest uh, if you plant it well then you can integrate carbon into your um, agricultural pr um, productivity activities and not destroy the agricultural value of the land but there might be areas where you want to plant a more dense forest say around your erosion gullies uh, or kind of connecting to forests um, one that's that's quite common down south uh, is to is to plant trees in a way that uh, gliders can move between two forests that are isolated, um, and so you you might plant the right species for that um, and plant that in a way that maximises the biodiversity and conservation um, of an ecosystem outcome and get a higher premium for that or even a biodiversity credit under the emerging nature repair market. So you'd want someone to help you design it so it's best integrated into your property and what you'd like to achieve. If you're happy with a a bush block up the back of your property and you're happy to just plant that as a block planting and, and not really use it for agricultural productivity you can do that if you'd like to integrate it you can also do that you just need to speak to someone who knows how to do that properly and, and navigate um, the species type and also the regulatory frameworks that are required i won't go into those now but that's what a service provider will do that service provider can be can have, take different forms uh, Oftentimes, obviously, there's do it yourself. Um, you could do that. I, I, I strongly suggest not. Um, there's just a few things to navigate, as I've just said. So I, I would suggest not. Um, but you can find project developers who very much like fences um, and uh, um, machinery operators can be just hired to achieve um, a, a product as a as a in the, and they can do, design that project for you for a cost for a fee. Uh, these these ones I'm talking about are more of a fee for service, so it's their cost plus a margin. They're, they're going to make a profit, but it's a fixed cost and a fixed um, a fixed margin that you can agree to. That's one type, project service provider. There are project developers who might come in and do a carbon project for you and take a share of the ACCU supply. So they might take 30% or 40% of the ACUs. In fact, they might take more than that if they're going to cover all the cost and take all the risk and just they'll, they'll, that. They'll do that, and that. And if you think about risk sharing, you're doing it yourself. You're spending your own money. That's all risk on you. Through to the other end of the scale, where it's just like an adjustment. They'll come in and lease the carbon right off your project. Carbon right is a separate right on title, so you can lease that carbon right to somebody. They pay you a fee, uh, an, an annual an annual payment for that lease. Um, and over the 25 years, they'll manage everything and just pay you a fixed lease. So that's a really interesting way to do it. Um, you would understand that that contract for a 25-year adjustment effectively, uh, similarly um, le leasing or a lease to, to lease off the the, uh, the carbon right, it's probably a complicated lease to design and, and, and um, to sign off on and get, get to closure on. Uh, but, but, but Bush lawyers are, uh, are, are sorting out their 
their um, skill set in this space. And so it's becoming more common. I've worked on several from the ground up of these leases. They're, they're complicated, but once you have a shared um, a shared agenda, uh, they can be they can be done. So you can lease it away just like you you would any uh, your property to somebody else for some other commodity production. Uh, so there's a whole range of ways you can do it. Uh, depending on how hands-on you want to be. Um, when you're picking that service provider, you want to understand what fees they're getting and how they're, char- and how they're charging. If you decide to go with the split of carbon you know, of the carbon credits, you'd need to understand the price of carbon. It might sound fine now for them to take um, 30% of the carbon uh, accus um, at $35, $38 a tonne, but if the price goes to $500 a tonne, then they're making a lot more money than um, they were at the start. Now, to be fair, if they're taking the risk, and then the risk that it falls to five, um, uh, as well as goes up, then that may be something you're comfortable with. I'm not saying it's not the right way to do it. They just have to understand that you need to look, think about the 25 years, how much is that fee actually going to cost you over time? And many um, farmers are comfortable with that, just knowing that someone else is taking all of the risk and sharing any, any upside. Um, that's fair. You're also for your 70% you're keeping getting all that upside. So, you know, it's it's not the, the worst way to go. Um, it's a 25-year contract if you're getting someone to look after your project. Well, hang on. It's a 25-year relationship. The carbon projects are go for 25 years. So you're going to be in that in that business relationship without a period of time. So do some due diligence uh, and and pick the right partner. Generally, that's who you like, right? You, you, you'll want to resonate with the with the carbon project developer because they're going to be coming on your property um, uh, intermittent or a lot at the start when they're planting and and, and protecting the, the forest as it grows. But then the management, weed management moving forward, um, they'll be on fairly regularly as well. So you'll need to do that, um, pay, that pay attention to that. Now, of course, you could enter into five-year contract plus five-year extension plus a five-year extension. You, you can do that. Uh, and that's that means you can choose to change your project service provider at some point in the future if someone's cheaper or better. Um, that's that's an option for you. Uh, there are about a half a half a dozen good project service providers, as I said, in the in the space. And in the next few years, this this industry will grow dramatically. So you'll probably find in, in five or ten years, there's, there's two dozen, three dozen um, uh, in your area, probably at least a, you know a half a dozen that are local to your area who know your project, your area. Um, so you can switch if you'd like to switch in the future, um, that will affect the contract and the contract terms, but I won't go into those details, but you can, you'll can you have those opportunities and also protects against the risk that, that they go out of business in the future. You can always flip and get somebody else to come in and take over. That all needs legal advice and accounting uh, taxation advice. You have to get legal advice and, and tax advice on your own. I, I'm not I'm not able to give you either of those things, uh, but, the, but again, the legal, the legal industry and the accounting industry are coming up to speed uh, on on the impact of carbon, um, I might pause there and just go back to make sure I t- t- tipped off. Ah, oh, the last one I think you want to see is uh, is really that question I said about understanding the future carbon price. What if it goes to five hundred dollars over the next twenty five years? Is it going to? Um, well, one of the businesses that I uh, um, have founded and involved is is an analytics business, um, and might come back to that one. Um, please don't take photos of this or screenshot it, but also note it is out of date. Um, this is a forward price curve for carbon. So based on a good analytics team's understanding of the future demand for carbon credits and the potential future supply of carbon credits, you can create a, with quantitative data or qualitative assumptions, you can create a forward price curve of what the price should look like. And here we've got it over the next decade. Um, the current price is around the 36 to 38. We expect it in this one, they expect it to shut at 39 by the end of the year, and it will rise consistently over time. Um, now, I'm going to turn that off and come back and look at you. Um, that's a for, that's one analyst forecast. Uh, there are three analysts out there who do price forecast. If you're going to do some financial modelling on a material project, you should probably get some advice on the potential future uh, cost, or sorry, price. Um, of your uh, that you can get for your accus, uh, but that was just to give you an indication that the price should go up. Now, why uh, why is it? Look, it looks great, of course, that the carbon price goes up forever. Um, it's in the reason is because car, that's how carbon markets work. 
uh, the cheaper projects get done early and then the more expensive projects get done later. And supply is, is forecast and understood. There's a certain amount of supply from those really good high productive areas through to the lower productive areas. The value of the land um, increases over time. So you've got to take that into account. So the cost of doing the project over time increases. The demand for those carbon credits also happens to increase over the next 10 or 20 years as we get to, towards Paris 2030, Paris 2035, and our, in ultimately our 2050 carbon net, net zero commitments that our government has made. Uh, and so you see that price continue to rise. I did show one more slide and then I'll stop talking, which was the cost of doing a carbon project. And it's something you obviously want to understand. Now, I, I went through some of the, 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 the things you need to consider there. The cost of doing the project is generally all of the cost up front and over the life of the project brought back to a present day uh, value and then divided by the number of ACUs that you're going to achieve. Um, so that's not, no, doesn't take into account price. Uh, that, that's all just cost versus supply of, of the number of ACUs. And you can see that now here, I apologies, the legend dropped off, but it, I'm talking about the teal, uh, the teal one. I don't know if you can see my uh, hand up on the right there, but there's purple, teal, and tan. Teal, the green one, is is the general supply of of environmental plantings uh, that that is forecast by this analyst market advisory group over the next um, 10, 10 to twenty years. And you can see it's quite a, well, it's a small number relative, um, but it goes up, it steps up in price. So the the, the teal is much thinner, down under thirty dollars a ton, uh, an acu. Uh, and it and it gets slightly you know it increases in size up to fifty. So how much does it cost to do a carbon project? Somewhere between twenty dollars a ton and a hundred dollars. Sorry, twenty dollars an acu and a hundred dollars an acu. It's absolutely specific to your property. Um, it's there, there is no there is the rule of thumb um, is something around three and a half thousand dollars a hectare uh, to to but it's plus or minus a bit there depending on your site and depending on the supply. Um, so that's the pure cost. Um, that's the cost per, per, per hectare. Um, so that we, you know, it's the real scale. Most people can probably look at doing a carbon project around $40, $40 an acu. The market's sort of there at the moment. It's not quite there. But if you include the premium, the market's at 36 if you include a premium of $10, then sure, you'll be in front. And that will then help you decide what kind of contract you enter into. If you just want to get your cost plus a margin back, 20% per annum or something, then that you can enter into a forward contract for the next 25 years to sell it at that price and take no price risk at all over the 25 years, or you can hold them. One last thing that I will talk about, and then I'll open it to questions, is um, insetting, uh, offsetting your own emissions. Uh, there's a, that's a big topic in in agricultural communities about other companies coming in and and buying buying your accus. Let's say let's say Shell, Ampol, um, the ones you might know, buying your credits and using them to, to offset their emissions from their from their fuel uh, production. You might at some point in the future be required to offset your emissions from your cattle or your farming operations. At the moment, you're not. At the moment, agricultural uh, emissions are excluded from the government scheme, so there's no requirement to measure or offset um, or cap your emissions from ag. That might change in the future, or you might find you get a premium product, for sorry, a premium price for selling your beef as carbon neutral, and therefore you need to offset the carbon emissions from your own property to claim that you have carbon neutral beef. So you'll need carbon credits to offset that. So should you sell them away to somebody else, or should you keep them for yourself? You can choose to do both. You, you can you can hold them in your um, registry account and when you want to use them for your own farms offsetting, you can use them. I would also I will point out though that to be carbon neutral, you don't have to use an ACU. You can use an international offset and international offsets are at the moment quite a lot cheaper. So what I, we find a lot of um, uh, participants and farmers and, and corporates who are doing these uh, kind of projects do is, Produce the ACU that has a premium value, and I'm just going to use a very simple example. I'll produce an ACU that um, costs me $25. Uh, I will sell it for $50, and then I'll go back and buy international offsets at $10. So for every ACU I'm producing, I can buy 10 offsets. So that's a way to leverage into carbon neutral uh, offsetting. Now, it might sound dodgy. It's actually 
um, quite common and then quite um, scientifically accurate, you'll still you'll still be someone will have created a credit which is a ton of emissions that you're using to offset your beef. Um, so there are ways to use accuse uh, as a as a hedge of integrity and to get a premium price and then to go and use do, use that money to do your own offsetting in another way in the future. You don't have to use the accu. Probably make complicated that, but you have a lot of choices and you're just because you're selling it away doesn't mean you won't still be able to offset. There's plenty of other places that you can get offsets um, to offset your emissions in the future if that ever becomes a thing that you want to or have to do. Um, look, I'll pause there, I think, um, and uh, and maybe open up to questions. Well, thank you, Raf, for your presentation. Um, well, yeah, we'll now move into that Q&A session and um, we'll I'll give everyone a chance at the end to come off mute and ask their question, but we've just sort of stacked some of the questions we've received in the chat so far, and I'll just go through those now. Um, so we had one before um, before the webinar started from An Andrew, and it was, um, what is the break-even ACU price in the current market? Or is, is that something you did you already cover that today? Yeah, I sort of covered that off. You know, right now we're we're helping advising and implementing projects across the country. Uh, they can be done uh, as in terms of cost to produce a credit. Um, as I said, I think as that graph showed, at about twenty five dollars at its lowest, but not at the large scale. Generally, it's about forty dollars that you can do some. Uh, the costs about forty dollars to uh, to produce an ACU. But that's the cost that's fixed over the life of the project, and the price goes up. You'll, you'll, if, the, if, if, as forecast, the price continues to go up, your profit will increase because that cost was a fixed price at the start. Um, it ranges somewhere between twenty-five and fifty dollars a ton. Um, there may be other benefits to doing more expensive plantings, like the biodiversity value and the biodiversity conservation that you might be supported for or funded for or get a premium for, that means you'll spend more. You could spend, I suppose, up to $100 a credit, but if you're going to get $150 for that credit because of its bite or you'll get a biodiversity offset and a value for that, it makes it, that makes sense. So each, each project needs to have those considerations around what am I willing to spend and what am I likely to get in return for. And as long as you can foresee the revenue will out, outstrip the, um, the cost, then it, then it becomes a viable project. Thank you. Um, another question from Andrew was about carbon providers having a succession plan for the 25 years. You know, what happens if they go bust? A succession plan for your partner, like the, mm. the project service provider, or for themselves? Um, to the, so I'll answer both in case there, there is any. They're both good questions. Um, as I said, there's a lot of carbon project developers out there and project providers out there. So uh, if one of them, if you one you choose as a partner for some reason goes in financial strife and can't produce and, and cannot continue, someone will very likely supply that service to you. Um, there, there will be a bunch of uh, half a dozen at the moment, but but many more come as the industry scales. Who will be able to provide those services to you? If not, you might be able to do it yourself uh, at some time in the future if you've got an understanding after five or six years of having a carbon project of what's actually required with fire breaks and weeding and thinning and all of the uh, admin and, and and governance. So there's a range of options if your counterparty um, or your partner in this um, is out of business. I, I don't think that's too big a risk. Uh, there are plenty of ways to solve for that. Um, any of the carbon project develop the carbon project service providers and developers out there would be interested to chat to you for contract fell over and they'd pick that up. So uh, that, that's, a, that's a common market. In terms of succession planning for your own um, for your own family on the farm. Again, it might not be what the question was, but this is a contract that lasts for 25, the contracts last for 25 years, and the project needs to be maintained at least for 25 years. So you are handing over a project to the next generation, very likely across a 25 year period, uh, and, they'll, and they'll need to understand what that re requires and, and considerations around agricultural productivity on your land and not whether or not you're happy to um, reduce the productivity of your land over the next 25 years, uh, but but the benefit of having an alternative income source, maybe that's for you, that, that that is the right decision. Um, but it, you'll have to factor it into your um, your own succession planning. Okay, thanks. One um, other note. One other note. And maybe it's been asked here. Um, uh, is that the best, the highest premiums you can receive? 
require you to enter a carbon maintenance obligation for a hundred years, uh, seventy-five years after the after the project finishes. Now that sounds terrible and onerous, and you're probably just switched all switched off. But it isn't as bad as it, it sounds. It just means you can't knock it down. Really, you can't knock the forest down for 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 a hundred years. So if some other commodity was to come in, and and you really wanted to clear your land, you wouldn't be allowed to without paying for that. You would have to offset any of the carbon credits you'd give back, or given that you probably sold them, go and buy uh, some credits equal in what you were given to be able to let you off uh, and, and, and be able to clear. You shouldn't consider that an option, to be fair. Um, you, you should really consider that someone will have to maintain or not destroy uh, that forest. In terms of maintenance, it's called a maintenance obligation. Really, it's to, we're just talking about fire and pest management. So stock standard um, requirements under council, state and federal. Um, uh, fire management and uh, and feral feral um, species control. So and weed control. So you you'll still have to do everything you would have to do on your land around fire breaks and fire management uh, and and weed you know noxious weed control etc. Um, you don't want to be that guy who's got a property where all the where all the uh, feral animals and feral and feral spe um, plant species are coming out of that, that just to just to maintain your integrity in the community. You want to make sure you do that. But there's stuff that you would already be doing, so it's not onerous. It's not any greater any greater cost um, to you. So it is it, again get more detail about that before you enter into a project. But having I was there when those contracts when those sort of clauses were written into the methodology, and they're intentionally lowest cost, not onerous. Um, because it would be almost impossible to forecast any expensive any expense into for 100 years. So we just the, the government. I said we but when I was at the government, it was we um, tried to reduce that just to all the things you would legally have to do anyway if you owned a property. Okay, um, I've got a question from Michael. As a farmer, if I do an accredited independent baseline for a soil carbon outside of the government registered project, I it's not at one of those. One of the using the clean energy soil carbon method. I got it. And retest later with an increase in soil carbon. So he's going to do this independently. Is there a market for the for the carbon sequestered? It's a really good question, and it, but it, it is one that takes my breath away when it gets asked because I do. There are risks. Um, okay, so there are multiple methodologies around the world. That you can apply in Australia, methodology being the method for calculating. Just one second. Um, and uh, so there are multiple methods around the world in the voluntary carbon space, uh, voluntary being those who would buy to offset their emissions, like uh, you imagine Qantas might to offset your flights or Microsoft might to um, offset its emissions from its um, data facilities. However, they can't be used for compliance. So the, the Woodside, Santos, um, uh, BP, all the ones I mentioned before, the big liable entities can't use them for compliance and will very unlike, it's very unlikely they'll ever be able to. So a large source of your demand is gone. So now you're only talking about voluntary buyers who are buying, like Microsoft and, and Qantas, who are buying for voluntary offsetting reasons. And they are becoming less and less attracted to anything that isn't highest integrity. Now, I'm just warning there that there are examples in Australia of uh, other methodologies where recognised farming um, uh, leaders have undertaken projects and have done exactly that and got it measured um, and have got issued a carbon credit from a scheme uh, and it looks good, but is there going to be a buyer for that credit five years from now, let alone 25 years from now? That's your big risk. And will they pay the premium price or will they be paying dirt cheap prices at $10 a tonne um, that uh, we see in the market? Now, we're in the early days of this market, so pricing is quite volatile. So you might see someone claim a high price one day and then the price is lower the other the next day. That's common in an, in an early commodity market. So just I'd just be very careful about that. Um, yeah. Okay. Next question is from John. Is it, can you give an update on the integrated farm and, and land management method with regard to stacking? Yeah, look, I haven't got great news on that. The, the integrated farm land management method 
uh, has been delayed for almost a year and a half now. It was supposed to be out mid middle of last year um, or early last year. Uh, the government still has trouble, is having trouble finalising that method. They're expecting it to be out by December this year, so not too far off. They haven't hit that mark for a long time, so don't hold your breath on it being December. It may well be later, uh, next early you know, early next year. Um, now, the, the thing about, for those who aren't familiar with integrated um, farm and land management method, it's a method that brings in under the one method the activities of environmental plantings, human use, regeneration, and soil carbon. And the, the term stacking is thrown around. It means different things. You're at the moment required to have a different project for each of those different activities, the environmental planting method, the soil planting method, and the human induced regeneration method, three projects on the one property. What the IFLM seeks to do is have one project with three different activities. I'm not sure it saves much money doing that or much admin. You still have to audit the environmental planting method one way. You still have to uh, audit soil carbon another way, and you still have to audit HR the other way. Also, the buyers are going to want to know which one they're buying. They're not going to want to buy an ACU from human induced regeneration but pay any environmental planting premium. So you, it, it, you know, it's, it's administratively easier, but I don't know if it actually helps you achieve a better price or any kind of efficiency uh, that's material, you know, uh, in, in its efficiency. The word stacking, though, could apply to doing the different projects under each other. And specifically, let's talk about environmental plantings and soil. So um, if you can't do at the moment an environmental plantings project over the top of a soil carbon project, but it's possible that it might be stacked vertically as opposed to just within the same within the same method. That's really difficult to achieve. Um, uh, the, just the, measure mean, the measurement the interaction of the two it can be quite onerous to measure, but you can still do it, and I, we hope for it. We think that that's a really good idea to be able to do that, particularly we have inter-rows where you're doing pasture renovation, pasture management, sequestering carbon in the soil between the rows as a separate activity to the biodiversity, to the uh, carbon tree planting project. So it's possible in the future that will occur if it does occur, you can switch methods. You should be able to I say can as if it was 100%. Most of the time, 90% of the time, the government knows what they're doing and they'll say, okay, you're doing environmental planting's method now. We have a new method called integrated farm land management. In the future, you can flip over to that one and switch methods. And so you can integrate soil, um, bring your two soil carbon projects together. But uh, that's that's sort of my update is we don't know yet because I haven't finalised it. The draft came out with some onerous requirements um, for that actual stacking outcome. So um, you sort of have to keep watching this space for the rest of the year. Okay. Um, next question is actually coming from me. Yep. If your planting has co-benefits, so a lot of landholders are doing these um, through living carbon or establishing these plantings and they are going to have some threatened species benefits as well. How can you do document or demonstrate those outcomes to achieve that premium price? Yep. So there's a couple of ways. Um, when we have a national biodiversity market, say the Nature Repair Bill and is is is, is in, implemented, and there's a a method for calculating your biodiversity impact and your sorry your biodiversity uh, value. Uh, you could do it that way. Um, but at the moment, right now, you could use a partner whose uh, expertise is in valuing um, that biodiversity. Uh, and uh, I think you know you, you'd want to be we'd be talking to some of the um, so someone like Accounting for Nature, who has set up a government-backed uh, method for accounting for the natural impact, the positive natural impact, and. Uh, any kind of standard like that will help you to ensure that you have a me you know a measured and verified impact biodiversity impact, which can then translate either into your carbon price premium or to the biodiversity product that comes off it that you might sell separately. You might sell that to under the nature repair market as a biodiversity value, and your carbon credit is something else, and they stay stacked together. Sorry to get complicated there, but you, there are there are um, a couple of emerging. Um, frameworks and for governance of over that and, and counting for nature is probably the the leader at the moment in that as isn't government backed 
All right, Raf, can we just can we go for about another five, ten minutes? We've got quite, sure. a, quite a few questions yep. that we haven't dealt with yet. Yep. Um, okay. Um, Sam asks, where can I find a list of ACU brokers in Australia and New Zealand? Our Market Institute on its website should have that information. Um, we look over here and look for the Carbon Market Institute website. Um, that is actually carbonmarketinstitute.org. Uh, that will they will almost certainly have uh, those names. I think if you uh, there are several that you would stick to um, that are proven. Um, you've got Core Markets uh, C O R E uh, in out of Victoria um, and. Jarden, J-A-R-D-E-N, is another broker um, that's that's been in this industry for a long time. Um, uh, there's also a a couple of platforms, um, Expansive, X-P-A-N-S-I-V-E. Uh, I don't know about the E, Expansive. Um, they have a platform for selling carbon credits through. Uh, that, that's three. There's another half dozen that you could use, but just look for... Um, Look for reviews and accreditation. You really want someone who's been around a long time and has a really uh, a really good product. And that um, uh, I, I I can't specifically recommend. I, I've just given you the three that I, I've known the longest, um, but there are a number there. Look at the car, talk, reach out to the Carbon Market Institute. It's their job to direct you and guide you to their members. If they're a member of Carbon Market Institute, they've probably had some due diligence done on their business. Okay. Next question is from Virginia, and it's, do you have any experience in um, the sale of properties that have got accus on them? Does it, is that, you know, a, a benefit or a, or a burden? Yeah, it's, a, it, it's another cracking question, and it's unfortunately one I can't answer with much data. Um, environmental plantings as a method is fairly new. There aren't a lot of properties that have had environmental plantings projects done on them that have then come up for sale. Um, we do, however, in our investment advisory sort of role in the industry, try to try to uh, calculate that. Now, you can imagine that's going to be as wide as a barn. Somewhere between the, ac the agricultural value of the land is zero, so now you're just talking about uh, the um, the bush block subdivision market um, for, your, for the sale of your property. That would be if you just planted four block plantings with no consideration of agricultural val or value or, or uh, any of the amenities of, 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 of the open country, um, all the way up to a project that's done in a, fant you know, in a fantastic silver pasture way where you're actually maintaining your productivity, maybe at a reduced rate, but your sustainability of that productivity might be higher because you've got less heat and wind uh, impact on your soil moisture. Uh, and so, if we, so in the in the in the worst years, it's not as bad. Maybe in the good years, it's not as great either. But it smooths out your returns. Now, a lot of the big property valuing businesses are working on creating that kind of valuation metric. Um, but it's again specific to each property, and that's why the design at the very start needs to take into account what you're going to want to do with that property at the end. Next question is from Lee. How does one find a buyer for a bilateral contract? Yeah, um, I think you can you can use platforms where you can list your uh, accus for sale. Expansive being one of them. There's a there's a number um, of them. Uh, I would speak to your bank. Um, Commonwealth Bank has a trading desk. National Australia Bank has somewhat of a trading desk that they if you ask your banker to refer you through to that trading desk they might be able to put you in touch with the buyer um, uh, a broker would probably be able to introduce you to a buyer who's looking for this kind of product so off the spot market but refer you to them they'll still take their brokerage premium um, for for intro, for that introduction there are, unfortunately there isn't just a single website where you can look for um, look for those counterparties yet but uh, I mean, I, I, we work with them all of the time. So we, most of the large buyers are, are clients of, of ours in some way, shape or form. Uh, they do struggle to have, enter into long-term contracts with a specific individual farmer on the land. Um, the, 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 the counterparty risk is, is, is too great for them. So they look for someone to aggregate. And I would suggest sort of putting pressure maybe on LLS um, or others to sort of maybe provide some kind of facility or introduction. Um, 
and that may be the case um, with with this with this mechanism uh, and this program that the, that that'll be part of what is provided is a is a connection to the buyers who can come in and and uh, and be connected to the sellers. Fair enough. Um, sorry, Kate. <laughs> sorry, Kate. Sorry, Kate. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the next question is from Ross. This is a pretty good one. Do carbon farming plantations qualify as a primary producer in the eyes of the ATO? They do. Um, I believe they do. You have to get your accounting advice on this. But carbon credits as a commodity um, fall into the I've forgotten the word for it, but it's where you can realise a gain, a gain in one year and smooth it out over several years. Um, it's popped out of my head, but um, uh, the the you know there is a rule, a tax rule, ruling that allows you to to spread profit over several years. Accu's a part a part of that scheme. So in, in the, sorry of of that um, allowance. So it tells me that they they can form that. Uh, I wouldn't, if you don't have primary producer status, I'm not sure I would do, I'm not sure you have a big enough scale of property to probably do these kind of projects. You're, um, you're, you're really looking at 100 hectares to be of a reasonable scale to do a project. Now, that could be a group of you getting together and putting 10 hectares times 10 uh, to create a 100, 100 hectare project. That's possible. You can do that. Um, but if you're if you're not already primary producer status, um you just need to get your accountant to answer that question. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Stephen. If you're claiming carbon neutrality, what oversight is there for that? In, in particular, what oversight if you're, if you're using international carbon credits, which you mentioned before, but the business is based within Australia? Or well, if you're going to claim carbon neutrality, you have to go through uh, the, uh, the government's um, Climate Active um, mm -hmm. Program. Um, and and there are a set of rules set out there about what is eligible, what credits you can and can't use. Uh, to that question before about alternative markets, alternative um, offsets, they're not those ones are not that you could produce if you did soil carbon projects with some other method. They're not allowed currently under climate neutral, right? As a climate active carbon neutrality. So you do have to go through the carbon neutral um, program, and they have oversight of what's in it and. Uh, you, you will have risk that the act that the credit you buy uh, may have formed some kind of have a kind of integrity branding problem but really you're just using it to offset and if you're offsetting you're offsetting you're not likely to get attacked like Telstra and uh, and, and Qantas and Rio Tinto are going to get attacked for using different kinds of offsets um, it's a ton and if you're offsetting a ton with a ton you should be comfortable scientifically at least um, you are you are offsetting but there is a whole scheme for that and there was another question there. Uh, I'll quickly answer. Michael asked around: um, Is there an options market that trades put and call options? Um, and uh, absolutely, there is. So calls and puts and calls trade probably a lot less regularly um, than 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 they will right now. They're they're quite sporadic, but there are um, there are trading desks who will enter into put options and call options and allow you to hedge um, hedge your position uh, or trade the market. Uh, if you want so that that was actually quite a good question is it quite a mature market you just have to find the brokers who broker that market and there are as i said half a dozen good ones so you shouldn't have too much trouble okay uh, you asked about buying the back as well um i know that the commonwealth bank uh, currently provides um a i've oh, forgotten the word for it where um you you give them your credits they pay you money uh, but you have the option to buy them back at a later date if you need them for offsetting, you know, obviously at some kind of a premium. Uh, it's called a repo uh, repurchase agreement. A repo, their repos are also um, a, com a commonplace. All right. I think we've covered most of the questions, and I think because we're running a bit over time, we'll um, we'll wrap it up. Um, so thank you for your insightful pre presentation. We greatly appreciate the time you've given us today and the expertise that you have in this field. Um, and I just just for everybody's benefit, local land services has natural capital advisors in every region to help landholders make informed decisions about their natural capital. So I encourage you to reach out um, to the advisor in your region. Additionally, through the um, the PIPAP program, there is support available to establish carbon and biodiversity plantings in some regions, including ours in the Riverina. Um, so please get in touch 
Kate, um, she's going to share her contact details in out there down there. There, she's a project officer for for that project. So if you're having more questions about that project, please get in touch. So finally, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to today's webinar. It's been it has been recorded, and um, Kate will send through the recording in the near future so that you can refer to it as need be. All right. Thank you, everybody, and thank you so much, Raf, for your time again. It was a pleasure. Thanks very much.